Center is dedicated to understanding the understanding of and the promotion of effective governance with particular attention to our local, regional, and state level here in California. As I'm sure you're painfully aware, this is no small task in this day and age. Uh, today, we're pleased to be teaming up with ASTRA in bringing to you this lunch and panel discussion. I hope that it's only the beginning of a series of such events that we can do together. Also, in going forward, it is my personal hope that we find reasons for engaging together over these issues uh, with one another over the uh, highlighting effective governance other than as the result of what I'm afraid is the very opposite. Uh, I want to extend uh, I want to extend our appreciation to those who've made today possible, starting with Professor Yan Tang, who is a research director of the Drosian Center, our senior scholar, Mark Pizzano, David Dillon, who you'll hear from in just a moment, from ASPA Chapter President and the interim Associate Chief Executive of SCAGS. Uh, Leon Kelman, Executive Director of the LA City Ethics Commission. Paul Hubler, Director of Government and Community Relations of the East Alameda Corridor, who's helped us with communications. And Aubrey Hicks, who just stepped in the door, our new Assistant Director of the Center, and uh, this is her main event. So we're to Finally, uh, my appreciation for his inspiration in making what we do in the Bedrosian Center possible. Please join me in acknowledging John Bedrosian. John. Brief word from Debbie, then we're going to turn it over to Jack Knott and the panel. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Dillon. I'm the current chapter president for the Southern California ASPA chapter. For those of you who are not familiar with ASPA, it stands for the American Society of Public Administrators. It's an organization that's been around since 1939, and one of the unique aspects of ASPA is that we partner with both academics and <coughs> practitioners to bring common issues and study common issues so that we're bringing information back out to all of the people that practice public administration. So we're really pleased to partner with USC today. They've been an excellent partner and this is a very organized and well attended event and we have some very esteemed people here today to discuss this issue with you. So on behalf of ASPA, I welcome you and if you're not a member and you'd like to be a member, we have some membership applications that should be. Thank you. Uh, I'm Jack Knott. Uh, I'm the Dean of the School of Policy Planning and Development and really pleased to partner with the Bedrosian Center and ASPA in putting this on. Uh, this uh, topic is exceedingly important to our school. We were established in 1928-29 uh, as part of the good government movement and we were established to train uh, local administrators in professional ethics and uh, professional practice from uh, human resource management to budgeting. And so we've been involved and engaged with this issue uh, for about 81 years, and we're really pleased to, with Bedrosia to host this and, and with ASPA. It's also important to me personally, uh, one of the uh, earlier books that I've written was on uh, government reform, and it focused on this kind of issue in the first two, three chapters, so it's something I've personally been thinking about for uh, at least 20 years as well. Uh, this issue is particularly difficult at this time uh, when the state and cities are facing serious financial crises and a long-term imbalance in their financing. It's also a time when there's a tremendous amount of anger uh, at government and frustration with the economy and the lack of jobs. So it comes at a time as a flashpoint, I think, uh, about government and we don't want to uh, make it such that this is what government is represented by everybody. It's uh, something that we want to talk about in terms of how pervasive is the issue. The city of Bell uh, really is the catalyst for this. Uh, it's a population of only about 36,000 with a per capita income of 24,800. The city is mostly Hispanic with 65% with no high school diploma. The unemployment rate in Bell is 16% and the poverty rate is 17%. So it's basically a low income community. But at the same time, city officials uh, had outrageously high salaries ranging from $100,000 to $800,000. It also had higher property taxes than Beverly Hills. It engaged in likely voter fraud and imposed an illegal sewer tax, possibly. 
So the city leaders have been arrested, as you know, and are out on bail. District Attorney Steve Cooley said that the complaint alleges that the defendants used tax dollars collected from citizens of Bell as their own piggy bank, which they looted at will. Supervisor Gloria Molina said the city leaders have proven themselves unable to govern ethically, fairly, or competently. But this issue is not just about Bell. Vernon and possibly other cities have similar problems. Uh, I was reading the LA Times just this past week about Temple City, whose officials solicited bribes and re in return for supportive development projects. They pleaded guilty to bribery, perjury, and other crimes. And the article says that this kind of corruption may affect uh, at least 400 California redevelopment agencies. So this is about Bell, but it's not just about Bell. The format I want to use uh, is one in which I'm going to pose a, a question and turn to one or two panelists to initially answer the question uh, that I think it might be most relevant to that particular question. And then uh, the other panelists are going to be free to jump in after that. Uh, and then we'll go through a series of four or five questions in that way. So we hope that we get a little discussion and dialogue among the panel members. And then we're going to open it up to all of you to ask the panel members uh, some questions or if you have some comments as well. Uh, let me introduce the panel members. Um, first is Hector De La Torre. He's assembly member from the 50th Assembly District uh, since his election in 2004. Uh, he is largely credited for leading Southgate residents in a grassroots campaign to recall corrupt elected officials and he's also uh, been a leader uh, in the assembly in submitting bills such as uh, Assembly Bill 827 to try to uh, create policies and a legal framework with more transparency and limits on these kinds of expenditures. Next to him is uh, Chris McKenzie. He was appointed in 1999 as executive director of the 112-year-old League of California Cities, the nonprofit private uh, organization that or uh, advocates for cities before the governor, uh, the legislature, and federal and state courts, as well as statewide uh, for ballot measures. And then we have uh, Dr. Terry Cooper. Uh, he's the Maria Crutcher Professor in Citizenship and Democratic Values at the USC School of Policy, Planning, and Development. Uh, he focuses research both on citizen participation and on ethics in administration. We're uh, pleased Terry is joining us from the university. Uh, next to him is uh, Jeff Gottlieb. Uh, he's a senior writer at the Los Angeles Times, and he's been a reporter and editor at the Times for 13 years. Uh, and next to him is Ruben Vives. Uh, he also uh, is a senior writer uh, at the Los Angeles Times, and the two of them together uh, really uh, were the, the uh, writers, reporters who um, uh, in their investigations unearthed the kinds of uh, salaries that were being paid and wrote these fine articles about this and through their investigative reporting. And this has uh, come on as one of the major issues on the political scene. So I'm uh, extremely pleased that we have uh, the news media and both of you in particular uh, represented on this panel. We're very privileged to have you join us. Uh, we're pleased that we have a mix also of uh, university faculty and um, head of uh, the League of Cities as well as a uh, member of the uh, State Assembly. So welcome to all of our panelists. Uh, so let's get underway. Um, I want to start with uh, a question about uh, checks and balances. Uh, State Controller John Chang uh, stated, the city had almost no accounting controls, no checks, and no balances, and the general fund was run like a petty cash drawer. So uh, what are the checks and balances that we might need to put into place uh, in order to prevent this kind of thing in, 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 the, in the future? And I thought that it would be uh, appropriate to start, uh, Chris, with you and ask you that question. Uh, and then uh, Assemblyman Tor. Thanks. It's good to be here this afternoon and with this distinguished panel. Uh, I think we've all been on a similar journey the last few months. None of us planned to deal with the city of Bell, yet it's given us a great opportunity to sort of clarify our core values 
and decide what's really important as we pursue the, the work of, of government and representing the people. As you design the kinds of checks and balances that might need to be added to the current ones, I think you also have to go back to those core values. And there are some core values of de democratic institutions. What, what, what is the kind of democracy we want to have at the community level? For local government officials, there's a core value dealing with local control. As much as possible, but within a framework of laws that guarantees ethical, as much ethical conduct as possible. And third, this whole concept, which we have focused a lot on the last two months, of openness and transparency. Uh, we have, in California, and the League has been part of putting those laws in place. In fact, one of my predecessors ha ha played a significant role in writing what's referred to as the Brown Act, uh, the Open uh, Meeting Act. And I can assure you, based on my research and talking with him when he was still alive, it was a very, very difficult thing to put in place because there were a lot of secret meetings being held. Now, I don't want to shock you, but there are probably still secret meetings being held. And we have a law that prohibits them for the most part. We also have a law which allows some secret meetings for good reasons. And so that law embodies a balancing act between openness and protecting the public interest. And where those two come into conflict is often where our friends in the news media uh, find the food for their stories. But uh, to tell you what, w what the major reform that we have proposed, and we went to the assembly member and he was very gracious and talked with us about it and incorporated some of those ideas and supported other bills with them, is uh, a really a new generation of a public records law that focuses on, and this is rare for a group like ours, by the way, to support a new mandate on local government. But we believed it was important that we have common standards for how compensation information is published, uh, common standards for how it's available. At the same time, we were uh, working with the legislature and uh, informing our membership that we felt this was important, not all of whom were really pleased with this, but most of them agreed with it. Uh, we began working with the controller, John Chung, whom you mentioned. And because state law already allows the controller to collect financial information from local governments, we file financial reports, for example, with the controller every year, he asked us to help him design a, a data collection system. And so we had a number of meetings with his staff helping to design that system with the goal of creating a centralized source of information, which we believe was really sort of one leg of the stool about how you address transparency, having the same information from all local governments available the same place. Now, right now, he's only been able to address cities and counties, but in the future, hopefully, it can be expanded to include other local governments. But the area we also worked on is what has to be available at the community level. It shouldn't be necessary for a citizen to come in and make a request and then wait and wait and wait for the information about what their public officials are being paid. Some of the more forward-thinking cities and counties had already published this information. I'm pleased to tell you today a growing number of them are publishing it. But we proposed a few reforms, one of which was to require the publication of that information on their website if they had one. And uh, if they didn't, to make it readily available, much like some other information has to be made available. We also proposed an amendment to the Brown Act, the act that we've explained to local officials and trained them on for decades now, that makes it abundantly clear that no contracts can be approved in private. Uh, we're all still waiting for the information about what happened in Bell. And I think at times there's a rush to judgment. I, I think, I can't remember if, if it was uh, our reporter friends here or someone else who said to me, well, don't you think we need a reform to get rid of council manager government? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. It wasn't us. Did, did you know, I'm sure it wasn't. <laughs> did you know that the council manager form of government was a major reform of the progressive era? It was designed to root out corruption and Tammany Hall type activities. And so before we talk about throwing that baby out with the bathwater, let's make sure we understand it, we understand its traditions, what it's designed to produce, and uh, that we move with great care 
that was the final point I wanted to make, is that we believe we need to move with great care because in the process of moving too quickly, we can also create new problems for democracy and for citizen control of government. Chris, are, are you saying that um, it's primarily a problem of information and transparency and that uh, there aren't issues having to do with uh, accounting controls or the way, the, the, the actual kinds of uh, mechanisms by which uh, cities like Bell are run? It's just no, a No, 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 I, I was addressing. Because uh, I'm interested in what kinds of checks and balances in the practice of managing cities uh, ought to be changed, or should any be changed. Um, we'll, we're, we'll come sure, back to this sure. question of, tra of transparency and information, but uh, it, or is it just maybe you know no, if we get the information out there, we're going to that's we're going to be okay. It's a, there are different levels to answering this question. Obviously, the public needs the information about what the compensation is, but if the problem is we've discovered since the audit of the controller was a lack of internal controls. What that really points to is the need for some, in fact, I've had reporters call me and say, what's your answer to Bell? And I'd say, like a good city manager? If we had a good, competent, professional city manager who would bring on a professional team, including a finance director, and that you do an annual audit, and you publish the results of the audit, and you, in, you put in place the internal controls that any professional finance director and city manager and city council holding them responsible for. Uh, there, I, I think there's a lot more that can be done with the controller's report at the state level to expose where there's a lack of control. You know, one of the things I know the controllers asked for is more permission to be able to go in and do audits. That may be a step that's desirable. But uh, listen, professionals, uh, local government professionals across the state have been shocked to find out that there were no firewalls like we have between special funds and the general fund, that one individual had unilateral control over all these funds. But that obviously happened. I don't think that's the case in, in most cities. But you can, by bringing in competent professionals, put those in place rather quickly and achieve a greater degree of accountability. Okay. Assemblyman, did you want to add to that? I. <clears throat> Chris and I disagree on a fundamental aspect of this. Uh, Chris, in our, our discussions, um, he talks about, and the league in general talks about, this is a Bell problem. These are bad people who did bad things. Well, I lived through another city, Southgate, where bad people did bad things. <clears throat> That's why I'm in the state legislature, because I helped to clean up that mess. And here, at the end of my time in the legislature, is another mess. So clearly, it isn't just one place with one set of bad people. It's a system that allows bad people to take advantage of it. And that system is very much still in place. <clears throat> the argument that local control will save the world just is not true. Because, again, I've just given you two examples, and I could give you more of, of places where things are going wrong. There are problems in accounting and accountability. There are problems in, the stru in some structural aspects. And in the case of Bell, they had a charter which allowed the city manager to be accountable to the city manager on fiscal issues. That was a charter that was voted on by 430 people in a special election um, uh, after Thanksgiving in 2005. That was how they got the structure to do that. Now, <clears throat> there are about 119 charter cities in California, and I think we need to look at all of those charters. And Chris and I disagree on this. The charter movement is an attempt to allow cities who are unique or have unique characteristics to exercise local control outside of the bounds of state general law. That's, that's what they're there for. Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco are perfect examples, but there are some other cities that have unique characteristics. And this is what state law says, the state constitution says, that 
cities have the power, charter cities have the supreme authority over municipal affairs. That's defined as elections, that's defined as uh, land use control, et cetera, et cetera. I completely agree. But things like accounting practices, things like pay of the city council members, there needs to be a standard across the state that isn't local control. Because accounting is accounting whether you're in Southgate or Bell or Los Angeles or Sacramento. It's numbers. And salary and compensation, guess what? It's the same thing whether you're in one city or another. And there should be a formula that guides that. And that's something that I've been working on. In fact, I had a bill in 1955, which was defeated in the Senate. Uh, it's the place, it's, I, I've taken to calling the Senate the place where reform goes to die. Uh, where 1955 was on salaries for uh, city council members in charter cities. And it was a structure not to set a limit on them, but to push them. It was kind of a carrot and stick approach to push them if they wanted to pay themselves more, to do it publicly. That's what the approach was. Uh, that has to be the way we structure these things. That if people, city council leaders, administrators are gonna do something, that they do it out in the public. And I'll, I'll close with this on the Brown Act. The only, prob the only problem with the Brown Act is that if you don't do it the right way, and you take, get taken to court and it's proven that you didn't do it the right way, the remedy is to do it again the right way. That's it. There is no real penalty. It's just you go back and you do it the right way. That's pretty weak. Uh, and, and when you get, when you as a taxpayer, as a resident, see your city taking these actions in completely you know, wrong and you want to have it fixed, well, they just come back, they do it again, uh, they, they do it by the book the second time, ta-da, it's cured. That's a problem. There needs to be some, some more teeth in the Brown Act for willful, uh, repeated violations of the Brown Act. Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? Maybe not. Um, did uh, Jeff or Ruben or Terry, did you have any uh, thoughts on this structural check and balance issue? Uh, not on the accounting practices, but, but I guess I would like to pick up where Chris left off with respect to city management. If that, is, that, is that okay or is it sure? Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> the, um, the creation of the council manager form of government was indeed a response of the American progressive reform movement to rampant corruption in cities, counties, states. And the premise behind that model was professional city management that would be able to separate politics from administration. So it seems to me, I'm, I'm finding myself in agreement with Chris, that if you look for the key piece in this puzzle, it's the lack of a professional city manager associated with a profession. Uh, the International City and County Management Association has a, a code of ethics that's the oldest code of ethics in the public sector. It's the most operational code of ethics in the public sector. And I heard one uh, member of ICMA at, at our, our conference last week of our schools, the National Association of Schools of Public Affairs and Administration, saying, again, as I've heard before, our code of ethics is almost a religion with us. And when I've gone to ICMA meetings, I've found managers engaged in deep discussion about the code. Uh, I don't know whether uh, this city manager was a member of ICMA, but I very much doubt it. And um, I've been trying to get some confirmation for, for that from uh, ICMA and haven't received it yet, but I would very much doubt it. So uh, it seems to me that, that that's the key piece in all of this, that, that if we'd had a professional city manager there who's associate, not, not simply professionally trained, although that's important, uh, but also associated with a profession that has some professional standards to uphold, including ethical standards, that this thing is less likely to happen. It's not a, not a surefire protection by any means. All right, so it sounds like um, it's both a matter of people uh, and structure and incentives. Uh, if I'm hearing correctly, uh, 
The city manager is a structure that I think uh, people agree, or that is a good structure, but it requires a, a professional city manager distinct from the, the politics of the, of the city. Uh, but that um, the point that the assemblyman is making, uh, that may not be enough. Uh, we, need, we need a check at the state level, and we need standardization and a rebalancing, possibly, of the uh, local control versus, versus central control in terms, especially accounting and finance and things like that. I, yes. I just want to say a, a couple quick things. Um, when we did the story that sort of got all the attention at first, which is that Rizzo was making his 787 a year, um, when we found that out, we knew he was making a lot of money. We were trying to get a comparison how does that compare to other city managers in the state? And actually, we called the League of Cities. I assume they had a list, a comparison list. They didn't, uh, which really surprised me, just for the purposes of when a city would want to hire its new city manager. Let's see the list and how we can figure it out. So I was very surprised at that. Um, and I think the Assemblyman's right on the Brown Act, which is, unfortunately, there are no sanctions. Really, it's just what he said, you know, bad boy, go do it again and do it right, and that's what happens. Um, and in Bell, clearly, all the checks and balances broke down. The city council, which is supposed to be looking at things, the city manager, the city um, employees, uh, I mean, the whole thing just sort of fell apart. Good. Uh, the, the second related uh, issue I'd like to ask about is uh, whether there are state policies with regard to limits on pensions, uh, limits on uh, salaries uh, that ought to be imposed. I know, uh, Assemblyman, you have uh, proposed some of these uh, kinds of limits, uh, and they have been vetoed now uh, by the governor. So is, is there a more comprehensive or a different, or is this the right approach uh, to controlling these kinds of salaries and the high pensions that, that uh, you find in, in a city like Bell. I, I would parenthetically add that the kinds of pensions and salaries that you find in California, from my comparative experience around the world, are extraordinarily generous. Uh, I, I have been unable, and even in what we think of as socialist countries, like Sweden and so on, that have anything remotely uh, like this kind of pay and this kind of pension system. So um, I think this is an important question. Uh, some legislation was proposed, but it's been vetoed. What, what uh, alternatives are there, or is there an alternative to uh, influence this legislatively or with policy? And I'll start with the Assemblyman, and maybe some others have it. I, I think uh, my views on this are pretty clear, since I did two bills on the subject, uh, one, well, let's be, going back to 2005, my first bill in the legislature was about city council salaries. It was about the stipends that city council members paid themselves for the commissions that they sit on. And in fact, I, unbeknownst to me, was the trigger for Bell getting that charter that I just described. My bill was signed by the governor in late September of 05 they went to the ballot in November of 05 because my bill became effective January 1st of 06. Uh, and it was all about protecting themselves from the law that I got signed uh, by, by the governor on these stipends. And it was inspired by Southgate, where when I was on the city council, the city, the, my colleagues, the three crooks, uh, <laughs> voted. You've known affection. Yeah, that's, that's how I describe them voted to give themselves pay raises on these commissions. They, they kept the salary, quote unquote, the same. That's, that's dictated in state law by, by population. It was about 600 bucks a month. But then they gave themselves a pay raise for these commissions that they sit on. And they paid themselves a whopping 36,000 a year during that time. That's what triggered my bill. To see Bell getting paid $100,000 a year for the city council members, part-time city council, a uh, much smaller city than Southgate, working class community, was just, I, I would never even fathom that. It, I mean, 36000 got me riled up. 100000 I, I just, I can't even get angry. 
Uh, so that's on the city council side. 1955 was an attempt to do that for charter cities, League of California cities. And interestingly, lobbyists in Sacramento for cities, who, who represent cities, were lobbying hard against this bill, very hard. And I thought how ironic it was that these lobbyists who are getting paid with taxpayer dollars, they're getting paid to represent the cities, are lobbying against some kind of control on city council salaries, which will save the taxpayers' money. I thought that was so ironic uh, that the taxpayers were getting screwed by their own lobbyist in Sacramento. And they succeeded, because they defeated the bill in the Senate. The other bill, 827, was inspired by Rizzo and his contract. And all I was trying to do there was get rid of some of the outrageous clauses that he had in his contract, and again, drive the decision-making of the city council public. So it had a couple of key components. No evergreen clauses. The contract wouldn't automatically renew. Uh, no pay increases built into the contract above a cost of living adjustment, which is set by you know, common state and federal law. Uh, and if they did want to give a pay raise above a cost of living adjustment, they would have to do a performance evaluation that would be voted on publicly after it was completed, because you can't do the actual performance evaluation in public. It has to be done in closed session because it's personnel issues. But again, driving them to make the decision out in the public where people could see it, where it would be agendized, where, where people would have a red flag that it was going on. That bill was uh, passed. Uh, interestingly enough, all of that crazy lobbying that happened on that other bill for city council salaries wasn't really there for this one. Interesting difference, even though it was opposed by the league. Both bills were opposed by the league. And then uh, Arnold vetoed it because he said it didn't go far enough, which is crazy because he's termed out. I'm termed out. No one else is going to pick this torch up, uh, I can tell you, in the legislature. Uh, so there it goes. An opportunity for reform is gone. So these kinds of measures at the state level uh, need to happen. Uh, I, I, I'm a firm believer that there have to be controls. Uh, it's like Ronald Reagan, this is the only Ronald Reagan quote I ever use, trust but verify, right? So uh, we're going to trust that they're going to do the right thing, but we're going to put them in, we're going to put some limitations. I've seen it in Southgate, I've seen, now we're seeing it in Bell. We need to make sure that some righteous controls are out there, regardless of, of this uh, idea of local control. There are common standards that have to take place in the state of California. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll see if I'm called up. <laughs> uh, would anybody else like to comment on this issue of uh, legislation as a or policy, public policy? Besides me, go ahead, go ahead, Chris, if you'd like. I've been waiting for this for six years, Hector. When Hector did such a great job on the Southgate City Council, uh, I lent him a member of my staff for two weeks to help him, and then he hired him away from us. So Hector, if you're wondering what this is all about. It's payback? <laughs> no, Hector, Hector really. Gary did a great job. Gary did a great job, yeah, he really. And, and the passion that Hector brings to his work is obvious, and he's just been outstanding. Um, we had a fundamental disagreement on his two bills, and 99% of it had to do with the fact that both of them, we were convinced, violated our state constitution. Now, constitutions are really, really precious laws. They are approved by the public. And in this case, Hector didn't read you the other part of the constitution that delegates to charter city councils the power to determine compensation issues. Now, the public can change that, and perhaps they should change it. But what happened is, and I don't blame Hector for this because the timing was very, very difficult for everybody. But he filed a bill in the case of 827 uh, dealing with the contracts, and especially 1955 dealing with the compensation for charter cities, before we knew what was going on. Neither one of us had done a survey. Neither one of us had had time to collect the data to understand whether we were fixing a problem that really existed and what the implications would be. And at the end of the day, our biggest problems with both bills were the fact that w there were two weeks left in the legislative session. One of the bills moved through committees and both floors in two days. 
there is not much time for transparency or for a careful study. Now, you may not think it was necessary, but generally we think that is important. And this issue of violating our own state constitution, which we believe was not even a close call. So we're often in the position of having to tell people what they don't want to hear. In this case, although I know his motives were noble, uh, you can't, you can't, well, two wrongs don't make a right. Our mothers and fathers taught us this. We can't violate one law in order to fix other people's uh, violations. We have to do it in the way that our Constitution is designed. So uh, we now, did disagree on this. We worked very hard on other things. Now, if, And I do forgive if, you. If we just assume for the moment that that's the case, that it violates the California Constitution, what should the League of Cities or other groups like that be doing uh, from a legislative uh, policy point of view in order to solve this problem? Uh, it, should, should you be uh, strongly advocating first for a constitutional should, change? First of all, some, we should determine, what? one, whether it's a problem, okay? That may not s seem obvious to everybody, but I agree with Hector, there's more pro than a problem in Bell or in Southgate or in Vernon. But to condemn the practices of 119 charter cities, or 115 of them, without understanding what they are, I totally agree. We ought to know what's in those charters. We ought to be doing it. And by the way, we stopped collecting the data on the salaries about 10 years ago when the city managers and the, the cities started doing it on a regional basis, because that's typically where the comparisons are made, on a regional basis, not a statewide basis, given the fact we're basically a nation state. But we have collected them now. But yeah, we ought to keep talking about it. We ought, to talk, we ought to be working on it. But first, we ought to determine whether it is a pervasive problem. And that usually is the basis for legislation. I know sometimes we act based on one or two uh, bad actors. But we ought to make sure we're not creating other problems in the process. Um, I'll uh, say two things on that. Number one, uh, in terms of whether it's a problem or not, I don't see any circumstance under which an evergreen clause in a public contract is acceptable. I just don't. There has to be a start and a finish and a public vote to renew. So to me, that was a no-brainer. Uh, the issue of the pay raise for a city manager above a cost of living adjustment, again, you're going to give the highest paid person in your city or school district. This, this applied to all special districts and school districts. It wasn't just cities. Uh, in fact, the first evergreen clause I ever heard of was in a school district for a superintendent. It wasn't for a city manager. Uh, that there isn't a circumstance where you would want to have an automatic pay raise for a top paid person built into their contract. Because that just, it's, it's on autopilot at that point. And we should never be on autopilot on, on things that are this important. That's, so, uh, on, on those kinds of issues, I, I agree. The, uh, Bill Lockyer had a great saying that the plural of anecdote is not evidence. And, and I, I totally agree with that. But in this case, these are never, uh, in healthcare they have something called never uh, occurrences, things that should never happen, like they you know, operate on the wrong arm or something. That, that it should never happen in, in public uh, government. And then second, uh, on your seats, there were some uh, charts that I handed out. Those are from my staff, the Accountability Committee. We did a hearing in September. One is on city council uh, compensation. The other is on city manager compensation. Uh, again, Bell is unique only in the amount of greed that was involved, where they took advantage of everything that was on the menu. Uh, Rizzo clearly had big appetites. But uh, in terms of the the pieces of the menu, they are there for anyone to take advantage of. And if you look at the chart on the city managers, you have PERS comp com contributions, 50, 60,000 a year. You have uh, city managers who get housing allowances, one and a half million dollars to buy a house. I'm, I'm, I'm not bashing city managers. I, I do believe they do great work. But some of these practices are happening up and down the state of California, and the public is, if, if they're aware, uh, they clearly aren't getting the import of it, and I think in most cases they're not aware of what's going on. And that has to be 
part of the discussion, part of the dialogue in the state, and in some instances, it has to be stopped. Thank you. Um, I want to shift focus just a little bit, and I uh, want to uh, especially turn to Ruben and Jeff and also Terry uh, for this next section. Uh, I want to ask about uh, effective public scrutiny uh, and meaningful transparency. How can and should uh, these be achieved, or do we have them now, and if we don't, how can and should they be achieved? And uh, Jeff, you want to kick it off, or? Well, theoretically, um, anyone should be able to go to a city and ask for, this is by the, ask for what we asked for that got us started. Under the California Public Records Act, which is expenses, contracts, um, what else did we ask for? Minutes to meetings. I mean, we asked a whole bunch of stuff. Now, we have evidence that other people had asked for some of this stuff in Bell, uh, but one of the differences was that if Bell could push away some of those people, and in fact, they also manufactured fake documents in a couple of instances, but would they push them away and for a private citizen to hire a lawyer and sue, I mean, it you know, costs a lot of money. Whereas for us, you know, we're a large institution, um, you know, sometimes if, if they're not giving us what we're entitled to under the law, we'll sue. And what happened in Bell, they clearly were stalling us. And they're entitled to take 10 days under the law before giving us documents. There was no need to take 10 days in this. They should have, it should have taken them about 35 minutes. But, but they were clearly stalling, and so every day after we submitted the Public Records Act, I would call the city clerk and say, is it ready? And she'd say no, and we'd say, okay, you know, we don't want to sue you, but we will. And then we'll turn around when we win and have the judge make you guys pay us uh, the legal fees, because that's part of the law. So, I mean, that, like I say, we don't really get any documents that the average person can't get. But talking also about accountability, and one of the things that happened in Bell is no one was paying attention. You know, these are a very working class city. People are struggling to make a living. Maybe four or five people would go to council meetings. And so you don't have anyone watching uh, the government there. And, and, you know, you can argue you get the government that you elect. And, you know, these people were elected. Um, but what happened, no one was really watching these people and if you're talking about accountability. Um, but like I say, in Bell, anytime people asked for documents, they were pushed away, given false documents, including one of our reporters at one time was given a false document. The one thing we sort of can't quite understand is why we weren't given one. Um, that's what we don't... But so, I mean, it's government, it's paid for by taxpayers, it should be open to everyone asking questions. Not only that, what, what the Brown Act says is, uh, we're, we're somewhat sophisticated in it, we can ask for exactly what we want, so they can't say, well, we're responding to it because you didn't ask for the right thing. They're actually supposed to kind of help you and, and do that sort of thing, and I think oftentimes governments city. don't, so yeah, government city clerks don't do that sort of thing. So. Um, Ruben, um, I was, I'm going to ask you what role you think the press particularly plays in this kind of transparency accountability, and I also uh, want to apologize. I think I uh, massacred your, the pronunciation of your name earlier. It's probably Vives uh, uh, rather than the way I pronounced it, but... Uh, that's fine, that's fine. Uh, well, we, I think what has happened in Bell shows that media is very important. Clearly. Here we have a city that was being, wasn't being watched by anyone at all. Uh, it was just doing whatever it wanted, at least the city officials there. And there is no major publication in that area except for us who now are short staff. So, uh, you know, we have some reporters covering regional areas. And I've been, uh, you know, my uh, assignment, which started last August, was the southeast, which includes Bell, Maywood, Cudahy, and uh, those other small cities like Southgate. Um, <laughs> We're not that small. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and clearly there was no one, obviously, 
digging through records there or, or asking or going to these council meetings and I mean th they did have a reporter but he just simply was out there to just report of what happened but wasn't asking questions wasn't looking more into these records what is I mean if you look at some of the old agendas which we've seen uh, it is just a confusing thing to look at it's you know resolution six zero this and it's just this small little uh, graph of weird language that you, you know to especially in this area where there's you know the education isn't that there, a lot of people don't have education there it, it can be kind of intimidating it's like well I don't even know what this is and so you're just sitting there in a council meeting not knowing what's being approved uh, but it, again it, go, it just goes to show that had we not been there you know if we were there earlier we probably would have caught this uh, sooner because uh, this this is a um, extremely important issue I think um, if you look at the number of reporters that uh, city newspapers assign to state and local government today compared to 20 years ago it's dramatically reduced it's it, it has gone down from a fairly decent part of the newspaper and cadre and reporting to almost nothing and uh, it's something that's happened around the country, not just in California. Uh, it, it much more is covered on several other lifestyle and other kinds of aspects. Uh, they don't have the financial resources to cover state and local government, doesn't have the readership. And a kind of check, public check, through the news media that always used to be there, lots of reporting on state and local government, people like yourselves who understand the law, they understand how to read these things, they know how to interpret it, we just, we just don't have that. And we were lucky in this, and fortunate in this case, that both of you were, were there and were able to uncover this, but uh, it obviously went on for a while before it was uncovered, and we don't know where else it is. So uh, this is, I, I think, a fundamental um, issue that of accountability, democratic accountability, uh, and the press plays an incredibly important role in that. And we have lost that at state and local government for the most part uh, because of the changes in the press and the internet and blogging and everything else. And I'm not sure what, what to replace that with, whether it's the kind of thing that the, um, Hector is talking about. or I, I think that's where the, the policy legislative challenge comes in. If, if the press is, can't do its job because we can't support a press, the way we used to doing that. What other kind of check do we need or do we, do we need one? You know, I just want to add about, you, you mentioned luck and there are days where I, I think about this and I really do feel um, it may have been luck that led Jeff and I to this story because really what started was me going to council meeting after council meeting in Maywood, which is what led us to Bell and sitting through these council meetings and then just suddenly one, one night you hear the police department's being disbanded. We're getting rid of all our city employees. This is in Maywood. This is in Maywood, 100% uh, contracted city. And had I not been there, had I been home sleeping, probably this would have just happened. But I I'm sure eventually we would have caught on to it because it was such a big deal. But again, we probably wouldn't have moved on it quickly and uh, as powerful as, as we did when we found out about it. I wanted to make a comment in terms of Southgate versus Bell. A lot of people ask me, you know, what, how is this any different? It's extremely different. In Southgate, there were two of us on the city council, uh, Henry Gonzalez and myself. And Henry, if you remember, is the guy who got shot uh, during the time that Southgate was going on. One of my colleagues got shot in the back of the head. Uh, he's still on the city council. He's a tough, tough guy. Um, Henry and I at the city council meetings, we knew that we didn't always know exactly what the game was, what, the, what they were doing, but we knew just they would give us the materials at the last possible minute, right, as we were walking up on the dais, and we'd just pour over it and trying to figure out what the, what the hook was, what the angle was, and then we would talk about it publicly in the meetings because they could outvote us, but they couldn't take the mic away from us, so we we described exactly how they were gaming the system, how they were screwing the taxpayers, et cetera. And um, uh, one of your predecessors, uh, Rich Morosi, happened to be there at one of these council meetings because they started getting crazy after a while because we kept outing what, they, what the bad guys were doing. 
and Rich got on it and, and really picked it up. Um, there was also a reporter for, at the time for the Press Telegram that covered Southgate. And so between the two of them, they really uh, covered the story and then you know, that, that media brought in more people and then things got really crazy and then other media folks showed up up until the recall. In Bell, there was none of that. The city council was in on it, all of them. Uh, the one city council member who wasn't in on it was completely out of the loop and he didn't know where to look to find the stuff that was... Uh, he didn't know that he was not in on it, yeah. Uh, <laughs> he was getting paid about 90,000 less than the other guys. Uh, so, uh, completely different situation. And Rizzo was a master of control. The one thing that really jumps out at you is how these salaries that he was paying all these administrators, the salaries that he was paying the staff, the salaries that the city council were earning, the loans, the one and a half million dollars in loans that he was giving out, that was all control. Because all of those people were in on it. They were all vested in that system. And so they all shut up. None of them said a word. It's really unusual to have a whole bunch of people who work together and not one of them says, hey, there's something funky going on here. And, and that's why what, what they were able to do is so important, because you wouldn't have been able to break through any other way. Uh, it's, um, it's rare, hopefully, uh, but it also characterized exactly what was going on in Vernon. Uh, it was a system of control in which uh, people were paid off to be part of the system. They all became part of the system eventually. And this is a classic trait of political machines. If you go back to the 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, almost all cities in the US looked exactly like this. It's a very, very familiar thing. And you use your authority and your uh, power uh, over the resources to uh, pay people off and gain control. And I don't think that's a, a surprising thing f from a historical standpoint at all. I think it's a very, very familiar kind of political machine approach. Uh, to controlling a legislature and, and setting up, even Vernon, control over vo voters because you couldn't move into the city unless you promised to vote for the people in power. And that's what old political machines always used to do. Uh, they did that in New York, same exact thing. Uh, I wanted to conclude with a uh, question to Terry and then others of you who might like to uh, jump in. And that has to do with what role do citizen groups uh, or grassroots groups uh, groups play in accountability and what tools do they have or need in order to uh, uh, play this role? Yeah, I, I think um, we normally assume that, um, that citizens are paying attention, that citizens are organized, and that by being organized they can gain access to the information they need to um, carry out the democratic process. Um, that all assumes that, that information is available at a cost that's not prohibitive. In this case, the city manager, and by the way, I think what you just said, Jack, uh, is right on target. This points up how powerful city managers are, for good or ill. City manager, in this case, turns it into a political machine, which is what it was intended to prevent. Again, the importance of professionalized city managers associating with other professionals and maintaining standards. So in this case, you have uh, the cost of, of getting any kind of information about what's going on in your government that allows you to determine whether this is a trustworthy government, whether it's behaving honestly and fairly, is extremely difficult. So what have we historically turned to? Uh, we've historically turned to the press, and we've thought that the press is, in fact, the last hope for uh, democratic flow of information or the flow of information necessary for democratic governance and the press is being systematically eroded and weakened especially in its capacity to cover local government. So what's left? Well it seems to, it, it, by the way, once, once the press provided this information, created some transparency, what happened in, in Bell? People mobilized rather quickly and began to get organized and express themselves. So the assumption that the people don't care and they're apathetic simply isn't true. It's simply that they, they don't know what's going on. When they know, they either act through their organizations or they organize to make themselves felt. Well, the, the only thing, other thing I can think of is something like what we have tried here in Los Angeles with the organization of neighborhood councils. Now, 
I, I, I expected to hear a, a collective uh, groan when I, when I said that from the audience, because I know there's, there are mixed feelings about neighborhood councils. But my colleagues, uh, Chris Ware and Julia Musso, and I have studied these neighborhood councils in LA since before they came into being for about 10 years. And you know, one of the key things that was provided there is something that we find working in other medium-sized cities, at least, across the country, and that's early notification. That there is a, something like the Brown Act. It's a, it's a legal requirement that before the city proceeds to do anything that's going to impact the people, there has to be notification uh, to the people. Now, you know, cities get around that by providing too much information, swamping people with information, and that's happened sometimes here in LA since the neighborhood council system emerged. Maybe, you know, I, I would have thought that Bell was too small to need anything like that, but maybe some kind of institutionalized citizen bodies that, that are uh, formal watchdogs uh, over City Hall might be worth thinking about. I don't know how well it would, would work in that society, but the key thing here is that information costs have been driven up to the point where people simply can't afford to spend the time that the press, fortunately in this case, was able to, uh, to spend digging this information out so that people could act on it. All right, anybody else want to comment on that before we go to questions? Oh, to the audience. Just, uh, I, I've told, I may have told these reporters this story, but I, I was a county manager in a relatively small Midwestern county. My mother lived in the county, and she told me regularly she loved living in the county I managed because she knew how much I made. And the reason she knew is we were covered by a couple of newspaper reporters, the radio reporter, the TV reporter. I bet if I went back there today, none of those folks are there. And in fact, the League of Women Voters came at least once a month, to keep us honest. Um, the revolution that's occurred in news media, I think, raises the importance of imposing an affirmative duty on government to disclose information it hasn't disclosed in the past. That way it empowers all citizens, whether through groups, whether acting in concert with the media, or however, to use that information. We now have technology that allows us to give not only reams of it, but meaningful information. And uh, I hope that's what we focus a lot of our efforts on. Okay, thank you very much. So let's uh, hear from the audience. Uh, any comments or questions? Yes. County Porter, Mayor Pro Tem, City of Whittier, and also in the EML program. So where does Bell go from here? How does Bell reconstitute itself and move forward with good governance? The uh, EML program is our uh, executive management of leadership programs. They're, they're in really bad shape. They have a major bond payment that's due in November. Uh, it's not at all clear that they're going to be able to make that payment. And unless they find a way to restructure uh, uh, or somehow figure out with their creditors uh, a way to get around that, uh, they will default. And whoever comes in in March, uh, after there's this regular city election, and there's a recall probably happening around the same time, if not the same day, they're going to come in to a city with with a horrible credit rating and, and complete inability to re restructure themselves. Um, that's the biggest worry that I have. And the current city council with uh, has no uh, financial roadmap. They 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 if you went to them today and said you know what are your obligations and what what does your balance sheet look like and you know what are your, what, what do your different funds look like? They couldn't tell you. Um, and this is three months, four months in to this mess. Um, it, 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 they're in really, really bad shape. Isn't uh, that an argument for a receivership kind of? Uh, there is no structure. There is no structure. I know receivership's been talked about quite a bit. There is no structure for a receivership in California law. We've looked. Um, and, the, you know, a, a city is an independent entity. And so, unlike school districts, which can be taken over because if they get into trouble, then the state financially backs them up, that, that isn't how it works for cities. So there is no similar structure for cities. They're gonna have to sink or swim on their own. And that's a very, very scary thought under the circumstances they find themselves in. I think come March, you'll get a new city council, some kind of new administration, but between now and then, 
the whole thing could fall apart. And, and that, that's my biggest concern. And I'm, I'm involved there on a regular basis. I'm termed out in November, but I've committed to the community. I'm going to keep working with them through March uh, to, to make sure that, that we can get something done and come up with a proactive reform agenda for the current city council to implement, not waiting until March, because March will be too late. Let's uh, go away in the back. Uh, she asked what uh, happened will happen in Maywood. I've been checking in with them. Of course, I've been dealing with Bell mostly, so I haven't been following what's been going on in, 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 in Maywood uh, recently. But my understanding is they're now uh, trying to figure out. They're also in a very tough situation because, uh, as you, some of you may have read, uh, Bell was providing city services to, the, to Maywood. And the, uh, Bell, now unable to do that, counseled, counseled the contract, and now they're trying to figure out how are we going to keep our city op operational. Uh, clearly, all they're going to have is a city council member, and, uh, city council members, and one full-time employee, and uh, one part-time employee, and that's it. That's really what the city's going to be. It, it's all in the air right now. What's going to happen to May? What, uh, to be honest with you, I. I no idea. And I think I can supplement that just a little bit because I've talked to the acting city manager. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's a form of, of city services in California and elsewhere around the country. It's called the contract city model. Now, Maywood may or may not be suitable for that. That's what they were moving toward, and they did it in a very dramatic way with a partner who clearly was not a reliable partner, having canceled the contract, which may be a blessing in disguise that that's what happened. But uh, Maywood has, technically has the option of contracting out a number of its services. We have in California and outside of California companies that actually provide municipal services under contract. Now those contracts have to be carefully negotiated, publicly uh, vetted, and it is possible to structure it. I understand Maywood's big problem is workers' comp insurance. The insurance. That right. they are not able to get workers' comp coverage because of some prior experience. Right. And so they, uh, until that history is worked through, it's going to be hard for them to get back on their feet in a traditional uh, city service model. Okay. Yes, right here. This is about how finance is handled in the city. Um, when you were talking about others, there's no divisions between the funds. Um, how are they supposed to look like if I look at a bank statement? Um, you, know, you want me to answer? Yeah, sure. Sure, the question is, how would you understand how the, the various funds of the city are segregated? Uh, the funds will be identified in the financial documents of the city, whether it's their uh, annual financial report or it's in their budget. They'll be identified as either the general fund which can, can fund almost anything and typically is financed with property taxes, sales taxes, and other local taxes and fees. And then there'll be specific funds. An example would be a water utility fund. And the money in the water utility fund can only be used for the water utility. So how they're labeled is many times the indication of their restricted purpose, but there are a host of state laws, including constitutional provisions, that restrict how those monies can be used. And this is one of the issues that came up with the tax that the uh, controller identified as being invalid. The voters had not apparently approved, this is what I understand, the uh, property tax that was uh, raised to pay for pension costs. But how do you verify that they're not being used how do you verify? An audit is the, uh, the tried and true, true method, and in every city there ought to be an annual audit. Okay. Uh, way in the back, and then this gentleman over here after that. Yeah, I'm with the California Community Foundation, and I was wondering what role you see for philanthropy in bringing private dollars in to prevent occurrences like this in the future. Do you have a source? That's what I want to know. <laughs> But Hector knows about 10 ways to put it to work, so. Well, we're, we're doing in, in Bell, in fact, uh, here in the coming weeks, we're going to be doing some community information meetings. Um, there are going to be a few of them. They're going to be exactly the same, so everybody hears roughly the same uh, subject matter. We're going to talk about things like the Brown Act and what a meeting should look like, because uh, they certainly don't know in Bell. Uh, then we're going to talk about budgeting and what a budget should look like and how you can find special fund, general fund, that kind of stuff in a budget. In a budget. One, one side note on that. When I asked the city of Bell for a budget, 
they gave me, so they, they do five-year budgets in Bell. So they gave me something from 2005. And they did not give me each year's amendment to the budget for each of the five successive years. So that piece of paper, that stack of paper was useless. Uh, it was their projections for the next five years. But that's, what, that's the way of getting to transparency, that you know, folks can play games with this kind of stuff. So budgeting, the third will be on the audit that was done in the city of Bell and the results of that audit by the controller. And uh, the fourth will be about their charter, the, specifically the Bell's charter, uh, and how it functions and how it differs from others. So we're going to be doing this in the city of Bell, whether there can be some uh, generic version of this that can be taken to other cities is probably a good idea. Um, can, you know, probably take into account how you, how you deal with the media. You know, if you see something that's fishy in your city, how do you try to get the Times or the Press-Telegram or one of these other papers, the Whittier Daily News, to engage on this? Uh, and what kind of information do you need to get their attention? Because it isn't just enough to be a gadfly and call and say, you know, such and such said bad things to me. That, that isn't enough. And so I think there, there has to be uh, an, an educational component at some level first for uh, our residents who, with the absence of the media, are going to have to take more of a role themselves. Yes. This uh, question is for you, uh, some of them. You just start to hit on it a little bit in terms of the audit. Um, most cities that are run responsibly have an annual financial report they put out that's published and given to the, to the public. Have you looked at legislation that would require that, although I think it should be already required, and that the auditing uh, firms that um, do those audits are held accountable for um, uh, realistic reports? The, the hearing that we had um, in late September in Sacramento, my committee with a couple of other committees, we talked about this very issue. And here's the problem with those audits. This, the cities go back to the same auditing firm every year. And the same auditing firm just cranks out a variation of the audit they did the year before. Uh, and they're just looking at process. They don't look into the numbers at all. Um, I think part of the reform that should happen is that there is a pool of auditors um, with some independent entity that certifies these are you know, good folks who do this work. And then that the cities have to rotate auditors every few years, not just keep the same one. In the case of Bell, I think they had theirs for, I don't know, over 10 years or something. Yeah. It was ridiculous. And so clearly, they were, they were just as beholden to the city as those employees making 300000 a year. That, there has to be a disconnect there uh, between the city and those auditors in order that it gets looked at with fresh eyes. And then in terms of what they look at, I think we need to be tougher on those standards uh, for, the, for those public documents. Um, I find that a really uh, significant issue, maybe more than it might sound. Um, this is the kind of thing that we had, uh, you know, with the collapse of Enron and so on, and Anderson Consulting, where the incentives are not for the auditors to do a thorough and careful job. It's the kind of thing we've just seen uh, in the financial collapse, where you have rating agencies that really benefit from giving uh, high ratings rather than giving objective independent ratings. And so it, this is kind of a pattern, uh, and it's, uh, to me, a bit of a disturbing pattern, if, if this is at all widespread, that auditors are not acting independently of the city and just doing the kind of thing that uh, they did the year before or uh, without seriously challenging what the city is. That, that is, that is uh, along with the press, uh, citizens, uh, and... Um, uh, you know, the auditing, those are really the three check and balances, uh, external, I think, that should prevent this kind of thing. And it's, it's uh, to me at least, disturbing to know that there may be some weakness in the auditing part as well. Gentleman in the back. Uh, Jim Grant, City of Los Angeles. And I'm just going to make a couple of quick comments for your consideration. I feel a little sandwiched. Um, and one thing the panel has not uh, dealt with are the disconnects, and by that I mean our citizens, including many of my neighbors, don't feel that I should be paid for what I do. Also, they fail to recognize that we too are taxpayers when they refer to us, so that's one element. At the other end, um, working with some of the elites, if you will, uh, I was 
in the Inspector General's Office, the Police Commission. For four years, I attempted to get the Inspector General uh, to accept generally accepted auditing principles as uh, the Government Accounting Ability Office has, has standard. I tried to bring the office up to standard, Institute of Internal Auditors, all of that. Uh, training was denied, even vacation time for training was denied. Ironically, he used that as a reason to get rid of the entire staff and hire cronies because we didn't have any of that training. So, you know, a lot of unintended consequences, but I, I, I think we're really sandwiched between these kind of disconnects, both the citizens and then the people who feel anyone can do our jobs and that there really is no professional standards, they know better. I have an anecdote for Bell, and then I'll let Chris answer the. Uh, I was at the last city council meeting, and you know the people in Bell are not, understandably very angry. So uh, a, a resident gets up and takes the mic and, and starts asking the council questions. And one of the questions they ask is um, how much the different people, the staff, that are up on the dais make. And so you can see where this is going. Uh, the city clerk, uh, after a whole back and forth, initially they said they weren't going to answer, the crowd gets crazy, then the, the city attorney finally answers what the amount is, it's 72000 a year or something. That's cheap for a city clerk, full-time city clerk. The crowd goes crazy, and I'm thinking, they have no idea what normal is. They've heard the 400, they've heard the one and a half million, and they have no idea that 72, 74, whatever it is for a full-time city clerk, is low. And, and, and they reacted that way to that. And so uh, I think there is, uh, a, again, a, a, a balance that has to be done here. The stuff that I'm highlighting uh, in, in this chart is the stuff that I think has to be reformed, that there have to be you know, limits on stuff. But the salary stuff, as long as it's within the band of what's normal and acceptable, I think we have to explain to people and defend that. Uh, it's, it's those outliers that we have to get rid of. Terry, and then uh, Chris, did you want to come in on this? Okay. Well, you know, I, I always bring things back to education, being a professor. Uh, at 2 o'clock, I meet a class called Citizenship and Public Ethics. It's one of our required courses, core courses in our undergraduate degree. Uh, these are excellent students that have come through a highly selective process here at USC. But what I find is that their civics education throughout the public school system or whatever private school system they went through, which a number of them did, is just almost nothing. I experienced that with my own daughter in one of the better school systems in this region, South Pasadena. I felt like I had to supplement that at home. And that's what I'm doing in this classroom. In citizenship and public ethics, I'm in part doing remedial work with my students to help them understand how government works at the local, state, and national level. I spend a lot of time on that. We have simply stopped preparing our people to be good citizens in democratic government, to understand government, to understand things like professionals who work in government and, and what appropriate pay is and what they do for us. Uh, so it shouldn't be any surprise when we see people go crazy and tea parties and whatever, all of these things that happen across the country, they have no, no capacity, they have no understanding about how government works and their role in it. And so they're susceptible to any kind of myth, any kind of lie that anybody wants to put out there. And they're certainly ill-prepared to deal with situations like, like this one in Bell and other places, or even just routine government. I really appreciate the point that you made and, and the other comments. Uh, it's been really hard to stand up or be at any forum or answer a question from a reporter and say, yes, what happened in Bell was atrocious, but we can't forget the hundreds of thousands of dedicated professionals across this country, tens of thousands in California, who are going to work every day in state, federal, and local government. And, and in fact, one of the reasons we were talking earlier, I believe Jack and I were, about the, 
we, we lose set, sight of the revolution in competence and professionalism and dedication that occurred uh, as a result of all the reforms of the progressive era. You know, as many problems as there are with our civil service, the reality is we have people who show up for work every day and for the most part work their heart out, and many times for not much money. So uh, I'm really, really worried about condemning public service as we're working to try and prevent the problems. We just have to exercise great care. I'm not saying anybody up here or elsewhere is trying to condemn public servants, but I, I think we should be very proud of the people who serve uh, the people of our state in government. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question in the back. Yes. Yes, yes hi. Uh, my name is Matani Kakte. I'm an MPA student at uh, Long Beach. Uh, my question is for uh, Professor Cooper. Um, you know, I was just listening to you um, criticize or well, describe um, you know, the civic education in our high schools and in our uh, public school, private school system. In, in, your, in your opinion, what are some of the ways um, we can, as in the civic government, the government educate younger people about, or provide civic education for younger people? What are some of the strategies we can use to educate younger people about, about civic engagement? Um, well, I would take you back to John Dewey and say experience is the best way to learn about those kinds of things, getting them out in the community to see what government does, meet with government officials. That's what I'm doing with our senior honor seminar right now that focuses on civic engagement. We're getting out there and meeting with people and talking with them on their own turf. You know, when I was in, uh, in high school, in North Hollywood High School, um, I was in civics class and I was bored to tears. And my teacher, fortunately, saw it, saw that I was, and, and paid attention. He came over and he said, what's the matter? You're not saying anything. I know you're a very vocal person, but you're not saying it. I said, you know, this stuff is just deadly dull. And it was all of those cartoons about how government works, you know, how the legislative process works, without any of the exciting action and conflict, you know, and all the stuff that goes on in the legislative process and the governance process. And he put a book in my hand called The Billion Dollar Blackjack. It was by William Benelli, and it was about the LA Times and its role in bringing water down from the Owens Valley. And there was a lot of it that was simply myth and untrue, but it was an exciting book about what's going on in government and what's going on in business and government, and it really got me excited about learning about more about government. And, and I, I trace my interest in government back to that book. However problematic the book itself may have been, it was a teacher who saw that I needed to connect with what's going on around me today. I needed to see something that connected with my experience. So my general response would be to you today, we can't sit in classrooms and troop through those sort of cartoon images of how government works and expect students to get excited about it. They need to see the action out there. All right, um, thank you all very much. Um, I um, wanted to just uh, conclude with a few observations. Uh, one is I'm really pleased, unlike with Lehman Brothers, uh, which uh, got involved in all the scandal and collapse. All those uh, senior managers there graduated from Harvard Business School. I'm really pleased to see that none of the managers at Bell graduated from USC. Uh, so uh, we got out of that one. Uh, but more seriously, uh, I think we've really addressed some, uh, at least three very critical issues here and maybe more, but one of them is clearly the a balance between uh, the enormous importance of public service uh, and the important contribution that professionals in public service uh, are making across the state and local government in California and the country and being careful uh, not to st uh, stereotype uh, government more generally uh, because of a few bad apples and trying to make a distinction and uh, trying to find reforms that target those bad apples rather than that might in fact, put more strictures and more bureaucracy and more uh, ways of limiting uh, local government and control uh, that uh, may be unnecessary if, if the majority of, uh, of the, of the uh, cities are operating well. Uh, second, um, there is, it seems to be a serious kind of question about accountability, democratic accountability. 
Uh, we have an erosion of the role of the press, and we are, as pointed out, very lucky and fortunate that in this case the press uncovered this, uh, but it might not have. Uh, uh, we also have, uh, as Terry and others have pointed out, we have less uh, citizen knowledge about civic affairs, and, and especially in, uh, it's the high cost of gaining information uh, about what is going on in, in government, and then also, uh, questions about uh, possible the role of auditing as an effective, et cetera. So there's a number of democratic accountability issues involved here. Uh, third, I think there was an important uh, debate, the discussion about whether it is primarily people. Uh, in other words, do we just need to replace uh, and get a professional city manager and if we could get the right very good people in there, that's the, the issue. Or, uh, as the, uh, Hector and some others have argued, uh, we really need to change uh, the, uh, the uh, structural relationship between the state and cities and possibly more centralization, standardization, incentives, et cetera, that uh, put more accountability into the system. It might be uh, both and. And it might be both and, that's right. Uh, I'm, I'm just posing some of the, the, the trade-offs and uh, some of the ways that we can, th we can think about this. And uh, I also wanted to close on the um, importance of education. Uh, you know, that's uh, the aspect that I and Terry and others come from, uh, the importance of professional training, uh, the, the importance of staying connected to that professional training over a lifetime, uh, and all the way from civic education all the way through master's degrees uh, that train people to work in the, in the public service. Uh, we have trained here at USC many of the city managers in Southern California and other parts of the country. We're very proud of those uh, graduates and we think it makes a very important impact on the way our uh, society and, and government operate. I also really appreciate uh, all of your uh, participation, questions, interest in this issue. It's a very important issue. I'm also very pleased by a partnership uh, between uh, the Bedrosian Center uh, and the American Society for Public Administration. I hope we get to do more of these uh, kind of forums and other activities together uh, to make uh, government uh, in California uh, even better than it is. So thank you all for coming. Let's have a round of applause for the panelists.